Today we will learn about the cherubim and the flaming sword. What does it mean? This powerfully poignant message will help us understand not only is there no such thing as a free lunch, but also there is no shortcut to heaven. Let's join Pastor Gary and find out. Take your Bibles open to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter number 3. And uh, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have fallen. You know, folks, I, uh, it's, mythology, it, it wasn't an apple. Uh, it was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Forbidden knowledge. They, up to this point, knew only good. They were in a state of innocence. And the Lord said, if you have your eyes open to evil. You see, God sees evil objectively. It doesn't affect him. And what Satan knew, and they did not know, was that they could only know evil subjectively. The minute they knew evil, they were enslaved by it. And what happens in Genesis chapter 3, uh, in verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Genesis 3, 22, Behold, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of what? There's the Trinity. First mention. Triune God. The conversation is going on between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. The man has become like one of us. They are Hebrews there, we have no plural nouns, but Hebrews are plural noun is three or more. Not so in English. And to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Could you imagine what it would be like to live in evil forever? Death is a blessing to us who know Christ. In other words, they won't live forever in this. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east. Now cherubim is a mighty angel. You have different classes of angels. These are very powerful beings. I told you God sent one angel and he killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night in their sleep. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim. Cherubim are the class of angels that are always near the throne of God. Seraphim are the ones that go out and fight. At the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God did not want them back in there. And I want to talk to you this morning about the cherubim and flaming sword. The cherubim and flaming sword. What does it mean? We're going to discuss that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the marvelous privilege we have to come into your presence in prayer. Lord, we're acutely aware that you're the living God. The Bible says the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. And yet, Lord, Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. Somehow, Lord, in all your immensity and infinity, you snuck into this world 2,000 years ago in the embryo of a woman. We give you praise and glory, Lord, for the mighty paradoxes of who you are. And we know, Lord, that we cannot approach you in ourselves because we are sinners. You're holy and pure and spotless. And the Bible teaches us that you sent your glorious Son, the second person of the God. He had the eternal word to come and tabernacle among us in human flesh. And he lived a perfect life in our place and kept your law. And Lord went to the cross and there died for our sins so fully that Galatians 2.20 says, It is as if we were ourselves crucified with Christ. And we thank you for having breathed your Holy Spirit into our hearts and spirit of God we acknowledge you today co-equal with the father and son the representative of the father and the son to us and Lord as we pray every Sunday of the year we claim Luke eleven thirteen, 13 where you said that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children how much more will our father give the Holy Spirit to us if we simply ask Lord we're asking right now because you told us in 2nd Corinthians 3 5 that we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves but our sufficiency is from you and Lord Jesus, you said that you're the vine and we're just the branches. So we ask you now, Lord, to send your spirit and give us what you know we need today, not what we think we need, not what we want. And as, Lord, we prayed in the past, we're not asking just for the anointing or, Lord, for you to help us today, but we pray, Spirit of God, you'll come and take complete control. Guard our thoughts in this hour. Guard my words, Lord. Let the word of God be effectual to our hearts. 
to conform us to the image of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. You know, one of the great proofs that the scriptures are the word of God is man's refusal to accept them. There's no greater proof that scripture is God's word than man's adamant refusal to accept it. The history of the world has been one of nobody can doubt, bloodshed, calamity. A uh, man has turned in every direction looking for an answer except the Bible. And he's just made a horrific mess of things. I was amazed in yesterday's News Observer. Uh, there was a picture here of the protesters there in Ferguson. They had shut down a mall there. And uh, one of the guys holding up a, a sign. And the bottom it says revcom.us. And I, I thought, well, Rev, that's going to be revolution. Com's going to be communist. So I went to the website. And sure enough, revolutionary communist part of the USA. By the way, the liberal media is not telling you that. that uh, you, if you've seen some of the black store owners there, they were saying these are a bunch of thugs that are not part of our town. That are coming here doing a lot of this stuff. And I, I looked, and the leader of this Revolutionary Commerce Party, uh, I, you could watch a video where he was having a protest with, a uh, debate with Cornell West, who's a famous, good black activist at the famous Riverside Church in New York. And I looked at a little bit of the debate, and the whole thing started this communist leader, was, the first thing he did was start blasting the Bible as barbaric and horrible and terrible, and saying that communism was the way for man to find security and happiness. And I've done this before, so I just Googled uh, how many people have been murdered under communism in the 20th century. And there was a famous book called The Black Book of Communism written by the top academics in Western Europe. One of them a few, uh, became later president of Germany. These are world-class people. And they concluded that 94 million innocent people were murdered by communist regimes in the 20th century. China murdered 65 million of their people, 10 million of them Christians, intellectuals. Those are the ones, that did, people like that, undesirables. There were only 50 million people killed in World War II. China murdered 50, 65 million. Russia murdered 20 million of their own people. Vietnam, 2 million. North Korea, 2 million of their own people. It goes on and on. He wants to tell me that his way of living, his ideal for a good society, is better than that the Bible. The Bible says, love those who persecute you, have mercy on your enemies, blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. They note that communism has killed more people than any idea or movement in history, including the Nazis. This eight-week video we finished this morning on spiritual warfare, underlined, folks, that there are unseen powers that forces in the world around us. But the lost world can only see the material and the visible. The Bible says we don't look at things that are seen, but things that are unseen. Things that are seen are temporary. Things that are unseen are eternal. Now, the Bible's a very old book. It's been around for centuries, a millennium. It was there before Christ. Thousands of years going back to Moses. It was there in the time of David, the great wars. It was there in the uh, early part of, the, uh, of our millennium. It was there in the Napoleonic Wars. It was there in World War I, World War II. It's here today. And the Bible speaks to the core issues of life instead of looking only at the symptoms like the world does. The Bible tells us the world has, this world's gotten into a rotten mess, and it goes back to our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, right on back to what we're reading about today. Something happened. There's something that's horribly amiss in our world. That our world is sick unto death. It's like a cancer eating itself. The Bible takes us to the irreducible minimum of man's problems. The Bible gives the diagnosis and the treatment. The Bible asks only two questions. And that is this. Why are things the way they are? And how can they be made right? The world will not ask the first question. They will only ask the second. They will not accept what the Bible says about why things are the way they are. They only want to say, how can we make it right? What can we do? And they've been trying for thousands of years with different movements and empires and religions and, and governments and all to no avail. But folks, I'm going to show you today that our text paints a perfect picture of modern people, the modern world. There stands Adam and Eve, kicked out of the Garden of Eden where everything was safe, all was provided. They're now alone in a barren wilderness, a vicious world, hungry, cold, at the mercy of the wild beast who themselves have now become ravenous due to man's sin. They're lonely, frustrated, and confused. Let's answer the first question today. Let's ask it. Why is this world like it is today? Why is the world like it is today? The world will not answer this. And if they were here today, they won't accept this because it's against man's pride. Folks, the world is the way it is today because man refuses to realize who and what he is and is trying to be something he is not and was never meant to be. 
And verse 23, 23 proves it, and his earth shaking. Now, I'm going to read verse 22 and give you my thought, but when we read it, some of you see if you can figure out where I'm going with this. You might be able to pick up on what I'm Verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, listen, to till the ground from which he was taken. What are we saying here? Man is a created finite being. He is a creature. He lives on the mercy of the living God. King Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall. His knees begin to knock. Daniel said, Belshazzar, the God who holds your breath in his hands and owns all your ways, you have not acknowledged. Listen to me today. This is unsettling, but this is Bible truth. This will stand by you. This will help you. This will lead you in the right way if you let it. Folks, your heart is going to stop beating one day. God has determined the amount of beats you're going to have. And there's nothing you or Rockefeller or Reagan, Bush, Obama or anyone, an angel in heaven or a demon in hell can do to stop it. We live on God's mercy. None of us are going to make it out of here alive. You figure that out. Man hates that. It's frightful. It's the truth. Who can deny it? Where's the mighty Hitler that brought Europe to his knees today? Where's Stalin? Where's Lenin? Where's Alexander the Great? They're in the lower regions of hell. And folks, the essence of Adam and Eve's fall and all the chaos and carnage ever since is man's refusal to accept that position. This was the fundamental, fundamental objective in Satan's temptation. What did he say? He said, hey, if you eat this fruit and you, you know good, but if you know evil, you'll be like the gods. You'll be like gods. And you'll no longer have to live a life of dependence and obedience to God. You'll be the captain of your destiny, the master of your own fate. And they jumped at the bait, and men have been jumping at it ever since. Nothing's changed. Man refuses. It, and folks, this goes back to Satan. Satan said, I will not live in subjection. Five times he said, I will be like the Most High God. What is his creed? I will do what I want to do. I have a friend who was a rebel. His dad was my preacher. He's one of my best friends in the world today. He said, Gary, I remember when I was five years old, my dad spanking me and thinking in my mind, I will do what I want to do. And he's serving a life sentence for murder right now because he's a rebel at heart and has been his whole life. That's satanic. I will do what I want to do. I've told you many times, but isn't it amazing that when the Lord Jesus said, I want to destroy Satan, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go do what he wouldn't do. I'm not going to destroy that beast in my power. I'm going to destroy him through weakness. And I'll go down, the Bible says, you know Hebrews says he went down below to a, a class or race lower than the angels. That's us. And tabernacled in flesh and was humiliated. And he says, Satan, I will do this. I will do what you will not do for my entire life. I will obey my father. He said, my very food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. And the Bible says it was predicted in the same chapter of Genesis chapter 3. The Lord said to the serpent, one day the seed of the woman will bruise your head. He'll stomp you and give you a death blow. And he did it in weakness. And he did it in a submission. He was obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross, Philippians says. And that's why God has exalted him now and given him a name above every name. And one day every knee will bow to that name of Christ. You know, 98% of the people, folks, who, we, Sherry and I were in New York recently, as you know. Thank you for, again for sending us. And you go to the, you know, 98% of the people that go to the Rockefeller Center uh, don't recognize the outright atheistic occult imagery that pervades that place in most, most American public places, if you had eyes to see. There, the ice rink, that's huge, beautiful, golden image of Prometheus. Of course, in mythology, and folks, in mythology, what just mythology? Prometheus is the one who stole fire from Zeus, God the Father, and gave it to the people. It's a picture of Satan. It's a cover for Satan giving forbidden knowledge to man. It's everywhere. And the whole human race, folks, the whole human history of our race comes from this one primary fatal fallacy. That's why the world is like it is today. It's because of this one great human conceit. Man in his own wisdom, not submitting. He will not ask the first question. He may not accept that this is why the world is the way it is. Paul wrote about this in a, a passage of 1 Corinthians. I'll read it to you. 
He said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God, power of their dunamis. We get our word dynamite. It's the dynamite of God to salvation. For the Lord has said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the great disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, you talk about who's really pulling the strings. Listen to this. For since in the wisdom of God, it was his plan all along, the world through their own wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. The message preached to save those who believe. The Jews require a sign. All the rest, the Gentiles, seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stomach block. To the rest of the world, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, as you, beloved, to those who are called, both Jew and Gentile, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, you're calling, brethren, to salvation. And not many mighty, not many wise, not many Rockefellers or Kennedys, what he's saying. Some are chosen. But God has chosen, for the most part, just the foolish, ordinary people of the world to bring shame to the wise. He's chosen weak and ordinary things to bring shame to those who are mighty. And base things of this world and things which are despised, God has chosen And things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's what Christ did. Christ came in a debased, mean, humiliated state and destroyed the powers of this world. That's God's way, folks. That's God's way. God's conceived a way of salvation which human pride, especially human pride, folks, and intellectual pride uh, is abased. Uh, I love the passage where Jesus, before the great religious and political leaders of the day, they're just after him. These had the, the wisdom and the power and the money. And beside him are his disciples. And they say, you know, he's chosen these ignorant, these uneducated fishermen and that stupid, hated tax collector. He choose, he's choosing these, this, this bunch of rogues to follow him. And it said in that hour, Jesus rejoiced. He literally laughed in his spirit. And in, his, in their hearing, he said, Father, I thank you. Father, Lord of heaven, I thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent men of this world and revealed them unto your babes, for so it seemed good in your sight. That's the way it works. Folks, man is created lowly and dependent upon God. They speak of the great accomplishments and triumphs of the human spirit. They never stop to give glory to God who endowed man with these great capacities. What you read about most folks in history is the ravages of the human spirit. Man came from the dust. He hates the truth. That's why he's always groveling in the dust. That's why every soul born of woman will one day come out here to this graveyard and return to the dust. Man's history is one of tilling the dust. The rebel against God. We won't live under your dominion anymore, okay? Get them out of here. Get them out there back where they came from. Let them till the ground. That's where they came from until they remember. And man's been tilling the ground every, ever since. We've tilled the ground in all of our wars. We tilled the ground in World War I with 40 million dead. Tilled the ground in World War II with 50 million dead. Tilled the ground in Vietnam with 2 million Vietnamese and 58,000 Americans down, dead. They t- they're tilling the ground today in the Middle East where they slaughter each other by the hour. Man's tilling the dust in Ferguson, Missouri. We're tilling the dust with broken lives, broken bodies. Homelessness, tilling the dust with drug addiction, sexual perversion, suicides and murders. Man is tilling the dust. And he still won't accept that he's a finite created being. Shakes his fist in God's face and says, I will do. You know, one of the most amazing things in the Bible is in Revelation when God pours these great judgments out of the coming. You think global, you think climate change. It says the men will gnaw their tongues for the heat. The sun that will burn them, all the plagues that are going to come. And it says, yet then they will not repent, but will shake their fist in God's face and will not repent of their witchcraft and adulteries and murders. That's the heart of man. Folks, the moment they knew evil, man was enslaved and placed under the dominion of sin and Satan. It ignited an inferno in us, folks. Are you not aware of that inferno inside of you? I am aware of it in me. You're conscious of it. Paul wrote about it. He said, I know, Romans 7, that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. I have a desire to live for God, but how to reform it I can't find. It seems the good I want to do, I don't do. 
And the evil I don't want to do, I do it. And it's fine, there's another law in my members that wars against the law of my mind in Christ. It's a law of sin. He said it brings me into captivity. There's a terrible, terrible power at work within us, even as Christians. You know, we wake up in the morning and we can't even get out of the bed before some evil thought goes across our mind. We're walking down the street trying to pray and some blasphemous insinuation will come, not necessarily the devil or demons, we're fallen creatures. And folks, we not only come to know evil as a sinister power within us, but we've seen the consequences. There's punishment. The, they were kicked out of the garden into desolation and fear and woe and depression. There's remorse, shame and guilt. And worst of all, folks, we discover that sin ultimately leads to death. It leads to death. The Bible says physical death and with those outside of Christ, eternal damnation. Something I can't fathom. Heart attacks occur most frequently on Monday mornings. Second most frequent time is Saturdays. I got up yesterday morning. I didn't have a heart attack. Don't panic. Sherry's vacuuming and somehow a breaker flipped. She said, we go outside and flip the breaker. And I hadn't been up long. And as I started to go outside, all of a sudden I felt a weird twinge between my shoulder blade. It was just a, it was just a feeling I hadn't had before. Three or four seconds it lasted. It, it went away. It's nothing. But, you know, it, it got my attention. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And as I walked down the steps to go to flip the breaker, I thought, you know what? There's going to be a day when Gary Williams is going to leave here. That couldn't happen to me. My kids love me too much. My wife does. And I pastor this thriving little church out in the country in Youngsville. You ought to see those people. I've been there seven years. I think after seven years, they're starting to like me. <laughs> and we're excited, man. And God's going to do great things, and we're going to grow. it. I, I can't die, can I? Yes, I can. Why? Because Adam and Eve, the day you eat that fruit and your eyes are open to evil, death will pass on you and all of your descendants. The wages of sin is death. And God knew, folks, as we read a while ago in verse 22, that man would attempt to rebel and get back into the garden or find paradise again. He'll do it all kind of ways except God's way. He'll do it through revolutions and governments and Roman empires and systems of philosophies. And God said, no, you won't. And they're still trying. So the Lord said, I want you to put a mighty cherubim there with flaming sword going every way. And don't you dare let them back in here. They will not come back in. And man's trying today. David Rockefeller said not long ago, it will take just one more major worldwide catastrophe for the human race to accept our one world government. I just saw the new one world trade tower. The imagery is all there, that, and the devil's behind it all. And I'm not accusing all those people, folks, of, of being malevolent. Because, listen, if you don't have God in the equation, nothing makes more sense than a one-world government. I heard a guy in England, oh, he's dead now, he was part of that. He said, he was a really nice guy. He said, the whole thing, he said, we've been slaughtering each other for a thousand years. We just want to find a way to quit killing each other. So it's a logical thing. I don't, I'm not down on everybody who buys into that concept. Because it makes sense if you don't have Christ. But listen to me, folks, it will not work. It may come to pass, but it's not going to work. Because God has put an angel saying, you will not find paradise without me. In fact, if my Bible is right, it says they will one day put it off. And when they do, there's somebody in the wings they don't know is there called the Antichrist who's going to butcher all of them. You know, there were powerful industrialists that helped bring Hitler to power. They thought they could control him. You can't control the devil, folks. What do the cherubim mean, folks? Where am I going with all this? Listen, always in the Bible, the cherubim indicate and represent the presence and unapproachable majesty of the living God. Every time they're mentioned in Scripture, it is in association with the unspeakable holiness, power, and glory of God. In Exodus 25, God tells Moses to build the tabernacle, his dwelling place among men. And you know the story that in the Holy of Holies, Behind that veil, they had what was called the mercy seat. It was the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold. The top lid was called the mercy seat. And he said, over it, you make two golden cherubim hovering, looking down. Because inside that Ark were the broken tablets of the law. It was a picture of God's uh, relentless wrath and hatred of sin. And those cherubim were looking down uh, on the holiness of God. By the way, a hint of the way God does things, 
It is only when that mercy seat was, seat was sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb that God would come down to bless the nation. So the cherubim see that, okay? Uh, so you mean that's it? I mean, we're just lost? No. That's, you see, you remember, folks, Daniel sees this image thousands of years ago, this world kingdoms? Nebuchadnezzar at the top, and you know it goes to Medo-Persia, it's got all the Babylon, all the great kingdoms, and the, the, there was the great Roman Empire, and it went on down to the feet of clay, and that would be a mixture, like a revived revi form, the government of the last day that's going to come. And so all of a sudden he said, I saw a stone that was carved out of a mountain without hand. And that stone came, and it smashed that image to powder. And the stone began to grow until it encompassed the entire earth. Jesus knew that stone was himself. He said, whoever would fall upon that stone would be broken. Oh, blessed brokenness. That's us. But whoever that stone fell upon would be ground to powder. What can man do, folks? What can he do? How can things be made right. Well, Paul, let me say this as I close. Paul told us in Hebrews that there's a new and living way by which man can return to paradise and find God's favor. But it has to come God's way. And anybody that tries to come other, that sword's going to cut them. Hebrews says, Therefore, brethren, having holy, boldness to enter into the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus, listen, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ the righteous, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Here's what happened one day 2,000 years ago. God came down to us in the person of Christ. He took all of our sins upon him, folks. He walked up with that angel. And he walked square into that sword, and it struck him down to death. The death of the guilty. But he didn't stay down. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He walked before that cherubim, and he snatched that sword out of his hand and broke it to smithereens. And said, there is a way now back. But you know what? You still can only come God's way. And you know what? For those who don't, a sword still lives. A sword still lives. Hey, they won't do it my way. They think they're gods. That's what Satan's told them. Let them till the ground till it occurs to them that that's where they came from. Listen, beloved, our race is tilling the ground today. People are being murdered and raped as we talk. People are dying of cancer and heart attacks as we talk. People are committing suicide as we talk. We're tilling the ground. We're tilling the dust. But thank God there's a new way through Christ. Yeah, the people, Jesus, they, the world will say you're a bigot if you believe this. Jesus Christ was either God in the flesh or the biggest liar and imposter who ever lived. He, you cannot be like Pilate and play it neutral with Christ. And he said this. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, and no one will come to the Father but by me. Satan doesn't mind if you're religious. He doesn't care how much you talk about God. He loves it. He creates religions. Just don't mention Jesus. Don't mention Jesus. That's why I'm really proud of our president when he went to speak at Georgetown University. And they had the IHS up there, that acronym for Christ. And he said, they covered that with a black blanket or I won't speak here. Good, Mr. President. Doing the devil's work. I say about any, if George Bush done, I'd have said the same thing. I'm not saying go out and promote Christ. We're a pluralistic nation. I was watching a thing the other day, Ronald Reagan. He was quoting John 3.16 all over the place. Talking about Christ died. Those days are gone, folks. I don't think you see a president on either side talking like that anymore. But listen, God will get the last laugh. Christ is in control. Let me close on this. We'll come God's way or we'll come no way at all. My question to you, have you come that way? 
Has there been a time in your life when you recognize you're a sinner? Jesus Christ lived and died as your substitute, as your sin bearer. And went to the cross and made a full payment for your sins so that you could be forgiven and saved by simply placing faith in him. There's no set formula for it. There's not a now lay me down to sleep type thing you say. The thief on the cross just said, Lord, remember me. The old publican was so guilty with sin, he couldn't lift his head and he just smote his breast. And all he would say was, oh God, have mercy on me. And the Lord saved him. And maybe you're here today, maybe you're a visitor, and you've never had a time you've done that. This is great. This is your day. In just a minute, we're going to bow our heads. And you know what? You can ask Christ to save you without saying a single word in your heart, just saying, Jesus, I come, yes, come into my heart. Here's the last thing I'll say, Revelation 3.20. The Lord says our hearts are like a door. Members of Oak Level, you know what I'm getting ready to say. So look at me, members. You start praying right now because there might be somebody here today who's never done this. Start praying right now. Here's what the Lord Jesus says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and S-U-P, the old King James word for sup or live with you. Live with you. Have you done that? If not, I invite you to open your heart to Jesus today. Christian, listen, while we have our heart beating, let's live for him. Let's live for him. He's an awesome God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, it's so full of truth. There are such powerful images in it. Lord, there are things we can read sometimes that don't even grasp it until your Holy Spirit opens it and shows it to us. And I pray, Lord, for those of us who know you, that you give us a burning desire to study your word. And Lord, when we read a passage like I read today about the cherubim with the sword, help us not just, help us not just to pass over it if we don't understand it. Help us to say, Holy Spirit, what does this mean? And Lord, we've got computers now. We can just Google a verse. And there's a commentator telling us what it means. Help us to be like those in the book of uh, the New Testament and where Paul said those in Berea were more noble than the other churches because it, it says they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things about Christ were so. Help us to be like that. But Father, we love you today. Thank you that the way is now open. Thank you that for us there's no cherubim with a flaming sword. And you welcome us back into your paradise, the garden of your love, because we can follow Jesus there. We can follow the trail of blood by which he has gone in that place and sprinkled the mercy seat. And when we follow him, Father, we see your smiling face. And we hear you saying, come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Lord, may each of us know and experience that in our hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.